1942. Close to 600 tanks of the German Panzer Army Africa charge across the Sahara Desert into Egypt. And the British send almost 1,200 tanks to stop them. And then all of a sudden, the ground started to shake. And that was the barrage that started. Two legendary commanders, Montgomery and Rommel, fight for control of North Africa. There was only one thing left for us to do, to arm the enemy as much as we could. The stakes couldn't be higher, and the fighting is ferocious. This is El Alamein, one of history's greatest tank battles. If there is a place called hell, I should imagine it couldn't be any worse than what that was. It's why I... It was an inferno, a scene I haven't forgotten to this day. Sahara. Vast stretches of seemingly endless desert, empty and barren. But just below the surface of this great sea of sand lies the evidence of a tremendous battle. A clash of infantry and armor so enormous it changed the course of the Second World War. This is what I found today. This is a German shrapnel from airplanes, and this is British. This is a German bullet because it is made of steel. If it was English, it would have been made of copper. It's rusty. This belonged to an English or German soldier. It belonged to a young man around 17 years old. I found it there. It's silver. Look at the teeth. All this area was used by the German army. The English were five kilometers from here. The Germans would fire east and the other side would fire back at them. There were armies everywhere. Libya. January 1942. For almost a year now, this part of the Sahara has been the battleground in a struggle for control of North Africa. On one side is the German-Italian tank force, the Panzer Army Africa. Its mission is to seize the Middle East oil fields, giving the Third Reich an endless supply of fuel for its war machine. On the other side is the well-supplied British Eighth Army, relying on sheer numbers and strong defenses to stop the Germans. The British are up against one of the most brilliant commanders of the war, Field Marshal Erwin Rommel, the Desert Fox. Throughout 1941, he keeps catching them off guard with lightning-fast surprise attacks. But by November, Rommel's tank force is wearing out. And the Allies strike back. Over six weeks, they drive the Panzer Army 800 kilometers west across the Libyan desert. By late January, Rommel is down to 228 tanks, 139 Panzer IIIs and IVs and 89 Italian tanks, infamously known as metal coffins. The British have more than 400 tanks, including 160 Valentines, and more than 230 medium crusaders. The Allies appear to have the Panzer Army on the ropes. But Rommel isn't finished yet as he writes in his memoirs. 
It was clear to us that the British would try to destroy our army with all the means at their disposal. Our southern flank lay wide open and they had a large choice of possible operations to choose from. A constant threat would hang over our supply lines, but the British were not to have the chance of exploiting their opportunities. For I had decided to strike first. The plan is pure desert fox. Push southeast through the unoccupied desert. Then swing north, hitting the overextended British flank. Spearheading Rommel's attack are formations of the Panzer Mark III Special. It's designed for tank-to-tank -tank combat with 50 millimeters of frontal armor. But it is the Mark III's armament that gives it the edge. With a 50 millimeter main cannon, able to fire armor-piercing rounds at ranges up to 650 meters. In early 1942, the British Eighth Army has nothing that powerful. Our long five centimeter guns were outgunning the English ones. They didn't have long barrels at that time yet. Their guns had shorter barrels, and that meant less penetrating power. They had a bigger gun, so they could engage us further away. We were definitely on the losing side from the point of view of tanks. The Panzer was a, was a better war machine than the Crusader, without a doubt. The Crusader is the mainstay of British tank forces. It's capable of a top speed of 24 kilometers per hour, making it the fastest tank in the desert. But the speed comes at a cost. The Crusader has just 32 millimeters of armor plating, leaving it vulnerable to anti-tank fire and its light two-pounder gun is all but useless against the Panzers. I suppose it would have penetrated if you were close enough, but you were been too damn close. All that counted was on one side the thickness of the armor and on the other side the penetrating power of the gun. Those two factors were constantly competing against each other. Better armor was built, and better guns were built. They only had the Cruiser 2, Cruiser 4, and the Crusader, and they were basically extinct. Rommel is betting his 228 Panzers can beat more than 400 British tanks. And on January 21st, 1942, he attacks. In the vanguard is gunner Wilhelm Hagios with the 15th Panzer Division. We went uphill for a bit, just a few meters. Then we were on the plateau and there was an English tank squad. We opened fire. destroyed two tanks at a distance of about 1,000 meters. And then, we suddenly spotted a Crusader approaching our firing line from the right side. We brought it down when it was around 600 meters away. was yelling over the radio, shoot, shoot. The Grant had approached our flank from the left side. And the Colonel was yelling, to the left. I turned the crank like crazy, until finally I had my sights on the tank. It filled my entire visual field. That's how close it was. 
And I brought it down right away with two shots. That danger was averted. We were surprised by these first American Grand tanks. The Grands, which arrived from the U.S. just weeks before, joined the Crusaders on the battlefield as the newest addition to the British arsenal. The Grant was a very good tank. And we first got the Grants just before the Battle of Alamein. And it was a turning point, take it from me. To get those tanks, wow, it was like somebody giving me a pocket watch, you know. It was, it was the, the, the thing. The Grants are a major improvement over the fast but vulnerable Crusaders. They have 51 millimeters of frontal armor, providing greater protection for their six-man crews. But its most unique feature is its powerful side-mounted cannon, a weapon that provides the Allies with an effective countermeasure against flanking attacks by German panzers. Okay, so panzer this tank had a 75 millimeter gun in a sponson. That was a disadvantage for us. Because when you were flanking them, you were attacked from the left side and you had to turn the whole tank to fire. And if there were other tanks in front of you, you would show them your broadside while turning. It was a big surprise. But even the new Grant tanks aren't enough to stop Rommel. His flanking attack catches the 8th Army by surprise. Over the next five months, the Desert Fox pushes farther and farther east, capturing the key ally port of Tobruk and winning back all the ground he had lost. By the end of June, the Panzer Army is inside Egypt and approaching the coastal village of El Alamein. Rommel is now only 300 kilometers from the Suez Canal. Victory is within his grasp. But the defensive-minded British have a nasty surprise in store for Rommel at El Alamein. Here along a 60-kilometer front, they have massed a huge tank force. They're determined to stop the Panzer Army at any cost. The first battle of El Alamein is about to begin. El Alamein, Egypt. A remote desert outpost on Africa's north coast. Today, little evidence remains of its turbulent past. But it was here, at this isolated railway stop, that two of the greatest tank battles of the Second World War took place. June 1942. For five months, Erwin Rommel and the Panzer Army Africa have been fighting their way east, intent on overrunning British-held Egypt, swinging north and seizing the oil fields of the Middle East. Rommel's advance has reached El Alamein. He is now just 300 kilometers from the Suez Canal, but the fighting has worn down the Panzer Army. We had lost a lot of tanks during the battles in Libya and Egypt. Our group 
only had 20 tanks. We should have had 220. By the time they reach El Alamein, Rommel has little to throw into the fight. 2,000 infantry, a few dozen artillery and anti-tank guns, and only 55 serviceable panzers. Any other commander would dig in or retreat, but not Rommel. On July 1st, 1942, he continues his attack. The main thing I had wanted to avoid was the war settling down at El Alamein into mechanized static warfare to the stabilized front. We planned to get through the Alamein line and overrun it before the retreating remnants of the 8th Army had time to organize its defense. The fighting goes on for 26 days, but Rommel can't break the British defenses. The first battle of El Alamein ends in a stalemate. The battle has been costly for Rommel. His panzer army desperately needs men, armor, and supplies. The German army in El Alamein was on the ropes. The biggest problem in the desert was a lack of water. You were always lacking water. It was even worse in El Alamein. It was now 1,500 kilometers to the standpipe, and every drop had to be transported by road. Rommel's rapid advance across North Africa has left him a long and vulnerable supply line. Reinforcements, fuel, ammunition, food and water must be trucked 2,000 kilometers to the front. Using the roads was a dangerous way to transport the water, and a lot of it was lost on the way. The English constantly attacked our water trucks. By late July, the Germans are losing 80% of their supplies to Allied air attack. In August, the 8th Army receives a half million tons of supplies, including 368 new tanks, and a new commander, Lieutenant General Bernard Montgomery. Rommel's time is running out. He can't keep pace with the Allies' rapid resupply. On August 30th, he risks one last attack, hoping to catch the British off guard and force them to retreat. It's a nightmare from the start. 256 German tanks advance towards tanks of the British 7th Armored Division and get bogged down in a minefield. Rommel, trying once again to outflank the British, orders his panzers to swing northeast and attack the Alam Halfa Ridge. Leading the attack are 27 of the Germans' new Panzer Mark IV Specials. Equipped with a high-velocity 75mm gun, the Panzer IV Aus F2 is the most powerful tank on the battlefield. The Mark IV is well protected with 50 millimeters of frontal armor but its heavy armor comes at a price. Each tank weighs 23 tons and burns 470 liters of fuel per day, fuel that has to be trucked across long and vulnerable supply lines. Rommel is betting that his superior panzers and mobile tactics can quickly take the ridge before his fuel runs out. But Montgomery is ready for him with 400 tanks and 200 anti-tank guns. The key to the whole Alamein position was Alam Halfa Ridge. I would not allow our tanks to rush out. We would hold the Alam Halfa Ridges securely and let him beat up against them. The first evening when we got there, we had a shotgun battle with some English tanks. It would have been better if the entire attack had been cancelled. And 
dann ist sie mir drei Tage lang. And we got bombarded by artillery and low flying planes for three days. You could hear the bombs approaching one after the next. But nothing happened to us. No supply vehicles got through to us. We only had a few scraps left to eat. Like that for three days. By September 2nd, Rommel has seen enough. After losing 50 of his irreplaceable panzers, he orders a withdrawal. He no longer has the resources to mount mobile attacks. The Desert Fox orders his men to dig in. In El Alamein, in El Alamein the war in North Africa had changed from mobile warfare into a kind of static warfare. The entire front was moving up, and the new front line was now between the mosque in El Alamein and the Katara Depression. It was a 60-kilometer front. The German line at El Alamein is ideally situated for defense. To the north lays the Mediterranean Sea, protecting the Germans' left flank. To the south, protecting their right, the Katara Depression. 26,000 square kilometers of deep, soft sand, impassable to heavy armor. Rommel's Panzer Army prepares defensive positions, including powerful tank-busting minefields planted across the entire front. These so-called Devil's Gardens were minefields that had been created by Rommel. We used every explosive we had in these minefields. These devil's gardens were very, very dangerous. This area is called El Metaria. This whole area was mined from the railway station and the sea to the depression. 70 kilometers, all mined. So many people lost their lives in the war. Seven or eight of my relatives were killed. My brother was killed by a mine. He never got a funeral. In 1946, they withdrew and left behind the mines but they were surrounded in barbed wire. They were marked with the sign of death, the skull and crossbones, but the signs were removed. The mines are still here, and there will never be an end to that. Rommel's battered and exhausted troops complete their defensive line at El Alamein. While across no man's land, Montgomery's forces grow stronger and stronger. He has assembled 10 infantry divisions and more than 1,000 tanks, all well stocked with food, water, ammunition, and fuel. Montgomery is ready for a final showdown with the Germans. And on the evening of October 23rd, he unleashes a massive artillery barrage. The guns blasted away. Nobody realizes the noise that was there. It was just like daylight. It was just one wall of flame. If there is a place called hell, I should imagine it couldn't be any worse than what that was. The Second Battle of El Alamein, one of the largest armored battles of the Second World War, has begun.
October 23rd, 1942, Allied Commander Bernard Montgomery attacks Field Marshal Erwin Rommel's Panzer Army Africa. And it begins with a massive artillery barrage. It's just like daylight. With just one wall of flame. The noise was horrific, and uh, no, so messages message of death going through there, it really was. Montgomery follows up with 700 tanks in a three-pronged armored attack. Two in the center and south are diversions intended to pin down the bulk of the Panzer Army. But Montgomery's main force will attack German lines in the north, aiming to occupy the Coast Road and the strategically important Kidney Ridge. We that night going through it all. We pulled into Kidney Ridge and uh, we finished up there in the dark. When daylight broke, we were amazed. There was a mass of vehicles parked into this small ridge. I thought, God, all at once, half a dozen planes with some bombs in it. <laughs> the absolute chaos. And behind us was the minefield. They had five or six times the number of tanks that we did. We were always the underdogs in terms of numbers. The English started their attacks with 300, 400, 500 tanks, while we had only about 50. That was the ratio at the time. The German defensive line on Kidney Ridge is thin. One regiment of 600 infantry, 18 anti-tank guns, and 47 panzers. The British attack them in force, fielding 150 tanks of the 2nd Armored Brigade. Then the order comes through that we went up on the ridge and did a bit of shooting. I'm searching for a target. That's much my job. You kind of carries out my orders. There's so much dust flying about. That is really chaos. Dust obscures the vehicle which is creating it. It could be a truck, it could be a tank. I'll say, a target, uh, Travis left, Travis left, Travis left, on, tank, Mark 4. And fire it will. You fire that tank, and if that one blew up, it switched to another one. I was wounded right on the first day. We got hit immediately in the early morning. A shell penetrated our armor and exploded inside our tank. This is a splinter from a tank shell from an English gun. These splinters were flying around inside our tank. The only thing you know in that moment is, I need to get out fast. I managed to open the hatch right away and fell out, more or less. Well, I lifted myself with my arms because my legs were already broken. Open the hatch, pull yourself out, and then drop yourself down. It was two meters to the ground. You knew it was going to hurt, but you had no other choice. The heavily outnumbered Germans have one big advantage over the British. The 88 millimeter flat gun, the most feared piece of artillery of the Second World War. The 88, a modified anti-aircraft gun, accurately fires high-velocity anti-tank rounds that can penetrate the heaviest armor, even at distances of more than 2,000 meters. When they used the 88 millimeter gun as an anti-tank gun, then, of course, uh, 
we were definitely on the losing side. There was another regiment on our right, which was one of the two regiments that had come from Palestine, never been in action before. If you go into action, you try and keep the hull down and just get up high enough to be able to use your gun. And they were sitting out there on top of the ridge. An 88 millimeter fired six rounds and blew up five tanks. Three and a half thousand feet a second. You could see the shells screaming across the ground. Before in a flash, you know. All of a sudden, something attracts you. There's a tank burning just next to you, and you're relieved. It sounds a horrible thing to say. Somebody just died in that tank, probably, but you're relieved. Because you know from your gunnery experience that half a degree on that site, and it was you. And it's something that's difficult to live with, actually. The feeling, I mean, difficult to live with. By the end of the first day of battle, Montgomery's tank forces had made only modest gains at a cost of 1,600 casualties and 120 tanks. But Kidney Ridge remains in German hands. Montgomery now prepares for an even larger attack. One he hopes will break Rommel's stubborn Panzer Army Africa for good. October 23rd, 1942. Allied Commander Bernard Montgomery launches a three-pronged armored attack in an attempt to crack German defenses at El Alamein. But Rommel's men are too well dug in. The attack failed, even though Montgomery's forces outnumber Rommel's two to one. The central advance has stalled near Ruissat Ridge, and hundreds of British tanks are trapped in German minefields. The next day, we sat around, um, and we were shelled fairly frequently. It was artillery shelling mainly, so we were all right in the tanks. Four lanes were going to be cleared, and we would then go through. But of course, it, it didn't go completely to plan. The poor sappers were being machine gun killed. Eventually, we got the old clearance to go. We got through. We, we got what we thought out of the minefield. The tapes had vanished. And when the tapes vanish, you're supposed to be free. This is uh, the whole battalion, you know. This is 57 tanks following in line and opening out. We went down into the wadi, came along and went up onto the other side. We got onto the ridge. As soon as we got up the other side, we couldn't get over the top because he was firing straight up. see a shell, the AP shell, coming along towards you, across the desert, in the daylight. You could see the, the shot coming at you. That was a, a, a tremendous gun, the 88, uh, the, the German heart. We then start taking on the anti-tank guns, firing the HE. Fired well, all our age, and uh, machine gunning, and then of course the tank battle started. We lost 
three or four tanks before you could say Jack Robinson, you know, got blown up, you know. You're, you're just there, you're winning it all up, you know. Then again, the next, the next thing, up went my tank. And all up, we stuck one of our own mines and went sky high. They all bailed out, the two in the bottom were pretty well knocked up. I was all right, I was in the turret. Commander was all right, he got out. I jumped out, uh, pretty smartish. And when I, when I landed down here, there's a telemine between my feet. I jumped out and that, 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 I thought to myself, well, how lucky can you get? Mayhem going on. Lovely moonlight night, and what happened? Getting a lamp light, I came across, dropping all these flares. And he saw all these tanks all nicely in a straight line, and he started dropping bombs. Despite the fierce armored assault, the Panzer Army continues to hold the line. Rommel expects Montgomery's next attack to come in the north, and he redeploys all of his remaining forces. Among them is 20-year-old Rudolf Schneider from Rommel's own combat group. And we have had on the night of October 25th, we took position in an area that was very flat. In the east, you could see the rising sun. The sun blinds you. And the noise, the rumbling, was our only indication of the enormous number of vehicles and tanks that were approaching us. And we saw 400 or 500 British tanks approaching the German lines from the east. We had strict orders not to fire until the British armor was as close as 800 to 1200 meters from our lines. Before that, there was absolute silence. The hundreds of approaching tanks include the Allies' newest weapon, a tank so fast and powerful that it would soon become the best known piece of mobile armor of the Second World War. October 25, 1942. The Allied offensive at El Alamein enters its third bloody day. And the cost on both sides has been enormous. But despite his mounting losses, Montgomery continues to order wave after wave of massive armored assaults directly into the thin German line. We saw 400 or 500 British tanks approaching the German lines from the east. Sherman tanks were approaching us. At the time, we didn't know that these were Shermans. It's a landmark moment in the history of warfare, the first battlefield appearance of the M4 Sherman tank. Outfitted with 51 millimeters of frontal armor, the Sherman weighs an incredible 30 tons. But the most crucial feature of this new tank is its powerful 75 millimeter cannon, capable of firing high velocity armor piercing rounds at ranges up to 800 meters. The Sherman is now the most powerful tank on the El Alamein battlefield. We waited until they were visible to our naked eyes. The anti-tank guns also had to wait 
until they were within 800 meters of the German front line. And then the inferno erupted. explosions, terrible screaming, we were just trying to defend ourselves, to survive. And the tanks were still approaching our lines. When the drivers figured out they were close to our trench, they would simply use their trench. He would stop his right tread would rotate his tank to bury our soldiers in dirt. The soldiers in the trench were buried alive or decapitated. Afterwards, you are just glad to have survived. By the late afternoon, there were around 300 to 450 destroyed British vehicles in the lowlands. They were burning. Wounded men were all around. It was an inferno, a scene often forgotten to this day. Rommel's exhausted Panzer Army holds the line for the next five days. But by the 1st of November, the Germans are down from 500 tanks to just 35. Montgomery finally has the Panzer Army on the ropes. He now launches Operation Supercharge, another all-out attack meant to break Rommel's line once and for all. I knew that we couldn't win anymore and there was nothing left for us to do. On the morning of the 5th, we only had eight tanks left, and we weren't going to get any more. We knew that this was the end of the Africa campaign, but nobody would talk about it. Not a word. In terms of equipment, this was inevitably the end of the German army. The fighting goes on for two more days, until Rommel, with only 12 panzers remaining, finally orders a retreat, ending the Second Battle of El Alamein. It's the first major Allied victory of the Second World War, and comes at a steep price on both sides. Of Rommel's forces, 5,000 are killed, 8,000 wounded, and 35,000 captured. Montgomery's losses include 2,300 killed, 
and over 2,200 missing. 8,500 are wounded, and 500 of his tanks are destroyed. I've seen life just so cheap, just flip, you know, flip away, you know, and uh, you get hardened to it. You learned after a while that you didn't get too close to anybody. That was it. That was it. You, you, you just had to live. You had to carry on. You were a survivor, and that was it. One Christmas in the desert, up comes the Padre. We've been killing people all day. Come on, lads, let's sing a few crowds. Peace on earth, good will to men. I'm afraid, I'm sorry, Padre, not for me. <laughs> and my religion was knocked out of me. <laughs> 